Hello, my name is Robin Veter. I'm the executive editor of the journal American Art, which is published by the University of Chicago Press on behalf of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. The museum gratefully acknowledges the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here in Washington, D.C. The Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we are gathered and the labor of people who were enslaved in constructing the museum's historic buildings. As we convene virtually, may we collectively contemplate the ancestral lands on which each of us individually takes refuge in this pandemic and acknowledge how devastating COVID has been to indigenous communities and communities of color today. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the celebration of the annual Charles C. Eldridge Prize for Distinguished Scholarship in American Art. The prize is awarded annually for outstanding scholarship in the field of American art. The prize honors Charles C. Eldridge, who was director of the Smithsonian American Art Museum from 1982 to 1988. During his tenure, he promoted scholarship through many channels, including exhibitions, the fellowship program, and the American Art Journal, which he founded in 1987. Funding for the prize is provided by the American Art Forum, a patron support organization that Eldridge himself established in 1986. The prize recognizes originality and thoroughness of research, excellence of writing, and clarity of method. It is bestowed on an author of a recent book length publication that provides new insight into works of art, the artists who made them, their audiences, and other aspects of history and theory that enrich our understanding of the history of art and related visual culture in the United States. Linda Kim is the recipient of the 32nd Annual Eldridge Prize for her book, Race Experts, Sculpture, Anthropology, and the American Public in Malvina Hoffman's Races of Mankind, which was published by the University of Nebraska Press in 2018. The three jurors who awarded the prize were David McCarthy, Professor and Chair of Art and Art History at Rhodes College, Cherie Smith, Professor and Chair of American and sorry, Professor and Chair of African and African Diaspora Studies at the University of Texas, Austin, and Paul Stady, Professor of Fine Art at Mount Holyoke College. The jurors wrote in a joint statement. What makes the book particularly compelling is how Professor Kim analyzes contemporaneous discourses surrounding anthropology and art. In her evaluation of early 20th century anthropology, she directs readers' attention to how race pseudoscience was defined and how it defined and challenges readers' thinkings. And she challenges readers' thinkings by describing the conception and practice of realism in art of the time. She provides a useful model of what art history can teach other disciplines as well as how to balance careful looking and theoretically oriented pursuits. Dr. Kim is an associate professor of art history at Drexel University in Philadelphia. In addition to her book, Race Experts, she has published articles in American art, frontiers and visual resources, as well as essays for exhibition catalogs and anthologies, reviews, and blog posts. Her research has been awarded grants from the Henry Moore Foundation, the University of Southern California's Shoah Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, and the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum Research Center. She holds a, a bachelor's degree in women's studies from Barnard College and a master's degree and a doctorate in art history from the University of California, Berkeley. Though her particular focus is on American sculpture and critical race theory, 
Dr. Kim has written extensively on the professional development of white women sculptors and the gendered formation of markets for their work. She has also contributed to the scholarship on African American artists and on the photographs of lynching. She is currently at work on a second book, a study of the labor conditions in sculptors studios and industrial workshops at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Today, Dr. Kim will be talking with us about her book, her reflections on the book from the present, and then she will take questions from the live audience. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, for the wonderful introduction and also for taking this uh, time this week to talk with me about my work. I also want to thank the prize jury and the staff at the Smithsonian American Art Museum for this award. I'm deeply honored by this recognition. In our working lives, it is such a rare and precious gift to be told we did something well, especially in the grinding year of toil many workers had in 2020. So I feel uncomfortable and slightly embarrassed about being singled out in this way, um, especially in light of what I plan to talk about today. Uh, for you see, I'm not going to present you all the, with all the choice best bits of the book, the select cuts that demonstrate the virtuosic interpretations and narrative skills to which this book prize presumably attests. Instead, I'm going to talk about things I wish I could go back and redo, and why. Uh, but not to worry, I'm not planning on giving a totally dreary, self-loathing speech, but it will be one that attempts a candid self-assessment of the book, a critical inventory of its weaknesses and lapses, as well as strengths and contributions. First off, you should know if you don't already, that publishing a book with a university or academic press takes a long time. So although the publication date of this book is 2018, I wrote all of it except the conclusion by 2016. That means when I was writing the book, there were no Muslim bans, no presidentially sanctioned Nazi rallies, no immigrant programs and children locked up in ICE detention centers. All that came after I finished the book. And yet, even after 2016, I don't think I fundamentally rethought my book and how it tackled race. This kind of wholesale reappraisal of the book did not happen until this past year. With the coronavirus pandemic and the radical uncertainty and doubt it sowed into every social interaction and the way it lay bare the complete precarity of life all around us, but especially within black and brown communities. And in the midst of all this fear and uncertainty, black men and women were being killed under the cover of authority by police for hazarding the smallest, the least perilous of deeds, for using a counterfeit $20 bill, reaching for their ID, or simply sleeping at home. For me, it took the succession of black death to finally reckon with anti-black racism as a central foundational problem in the US. One which I now acknowledge my book does, not, does a poor job of addressing. So what does my book do? What kinds of critical work or contributions does it make? The book is on a racial exhibit that was installed in the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History in 1933. The races of mankind, as the exhibit was called, represented over 67 racial types in 104 life-size bronze sculptures and was the largest exhibit on race and the most extensive use of freestanding sculpture ever installed in a natural history museum. The total cost of the exhibit was uh, at $158,000 roughly 2.8 million today, made it one of the most expensive exhibits mounted in a museum to that date. And the Races of Mankind was an enormously popular exhibit, recording over 3 million visitors to its galleries in the first year of its opening. That year, the museum recorded not only its highest attendance of all time, but also the highest attendance of any museum in the US. 
all of the sculptures were the work of a single artist, Malvina Hoffman. In the course of the commission, Hoffman traveled for three years, working in parts of Europe, East and South Asia and the Pacific Islands, in order to consult with an international array of anthropologists, study and find models and make her sculptures. The races of mankind absorbed four years of her life and became intimately bound with her professional reputation. It was the magnum opus of her six decades as a sculptor, an association which she contributed to when she published a travel memoir entitled Heads and Tails about her work on the project. Heads and Tails proved an enormous success too, holding for nine weeks on the bestseller list of the top eight major cities in the US in 1936. As an art historian, I was drawn to the races of mankind, not only because it was this vast, sprawling, ambitious project on race, but because of the artist. I was immediately intrigued by the question, why an artist? Why not some other technician like the exhibit designers and mannequin fabricators already on staff at the museum? Why hire an artist to make a racial exhibit in the 1930s? Also, why this artist? What did Hoffman as an artist bring into the context of race that no other specialist could provide? What were her skills and competencies, especially as they contrasted with or complemented the skills of the museum's anthropologists? Hoffman herself made the museum's decision to hire her seem utterly pragmatic and imminent. In a 1933 interview, Hoffman told a reporter, the study of mankind could enlist no keener observer and more accurate receiver than a sincere artist. From early childhood, the artist learns to study and memorize facial and bodily forms, instinctively seeks out distinguishing features and interprets the character of the already familiar faces." End quote. For Hoffman, this optical disposition to the world aligned the artist with anthropologists and scientists working on race for they also observed and recorded the human form, scanning its surfaces, attempting to identify its principal characteristics. Even some of the tools that she used were familiar to physical anthropologists at the museum. In the photograph on the right, we see Hoffman using calipers to measure the woman who modeled for her Balinese woman. Spreading calipers were also standard tools within anthropological laboratories, as the photograph on the left shows. They were used to measure the breadth of forms, in this case, the head length, which was usually used to calculate something called the cephalic index, believed to be an important physical index of race. In the sculpture's case, however, calipers were not used to measure the absolute dimensions of physical features, but merely used to verify the proportions of their sculpted representations. Nearby, in the photograph of Hoffman in the model, on an impromptu modeling stand made out of a packing crate, stands the clay in progress against which Hoffman will set the locked arms of the caliper to gauge her sculpture, working back and forth between clay and flesh. Further confirmation of the artist's distinctive use of measuring implements comes from a close examination of the calipers used by anthropologists versus sculptors. On the right is an illustration of sculptor's tools Hoffman reproduced in her 1939 sculpture manual, Sculpture Inside and Out. In the center, inside the boxed in area, you can see three different calipers of varying sizes alongside chisels, mallets, and scrapers that constitute the sculptor's many tools of the trade. But you will notice that there is a critical part missing in the sculptor's caliper from the one used by anthropologists illustrated on the left. The calibrated bar set between the arms marked in red. Without this ruled guide, the sculptor's caliper cannot produce a numerical measurement as the anthropologist's instrument does. Instead of being used to extract numbers from the body, to be abstracted away in tables and charts, or set into calculations of cephalic indexes and facial angles, the sculptor's caliper was grounded in the material embodied condition of the artist's practice, transferring the density and form of the body into another medium. 
Another point of departure between artists and anthropologists approach to race came in the form of a different set of tools. Early in the commission, the museum's anthropologists provided Hoffman with a box containing hair samples and glass eyes, probably ones like these kits on the left in the museum's anthropology department collections today. According to Hoffman, she was instructed to match these colors accurately to the models and to note just which shade of hair and eyes they happened to have. But shortly after receiving the package, she wrote to the museum thanking them, but at the same time expressing her doubts and hesitation. Quote, they look extremely scientific and anthropological in every sense, but between you and me and God, I'm not worrying about the use of these much as there's trouble enough in our camp without trying to match celluloid platinum blonde curls to the shaven heads of my oriental victims." End quote. And within, within a few months, she sent the entire box back. In place of hair and eye color kits, the artist's sketchbooks attest to the many representational resources she had to convey the color and form of race. Hoffman's skepticism about the anthropo anthropologist's tools conveys the weaknesses of race science, its mishaps when faced with the actual physical diversity of people. Sometimes the tools do not encompass the range of variations, black and brown versus platinum celluloid blonde. And at other times, the tools do not take into account how people, ever eluding the anthropologist's epistemological grasp, modify their appearance by shaving or diving, dyeing their hair. My book chronicles numerous instances like these in which the artists questioned the instructions and criticisms of the museum anthropologists, challenging the racial premises of their discipline and their presumed expertise on race. But the ineluctable conclusion of my research that the artists saw race differently from the anthropologists also seemed to be pulling me into a rhetorical trap that I was struggling to avoid. For you see, by arguing that the artist opposed the anthropological vision of race, I backed myself up into a corner in which I seemed to be arguing that the artist opposed race. And that was an argument that my empirical evidence emphatically did not support. Hoffman was indeed every bit as invested in seeing race as the anthropologists were, as the statement I quoted earlier suggests. Moreover, I was really anxious throughout the writing of the book that I didn't fall prey to the impulse to raise up the artist as a kind of racial messiah of her times. There's a very strong compulsion within art history perhaps driven by the discourse of avant-gardist exceptionalism to exonerate the artists from racism, or at least set them apart from their times. And the reason this is a problem is that such narratives of artistic exceptionalism reinforce the notion that race is about personal biases or dispositions, as opposed to a system in which we are all made to perform our parts. That is why bringing in a third party everyday Americans and the three-part structure of my argument is so critical to the book. By triangulating Hoffman's role in the races of mankind as one which worked within and between art, science, and common sense ideas about race, I hope to displace the binary contest in which science was always in danger of losing out to the artist and expand the field of race to remind readers that experts, whether artists or anthropologists, always exist within larger systems of racial reasoning and action. In the book, I brought in the third party common sense thinking about race in several ways. First, I cite the multiple instances in which Hoffman drew upon popular cultural sources like circus and sideshow acts and world's fairs, as well as contemporary press photography and novels for her representations of race. From these sources, Hoffman recruited models as well as display strategies, such as staging bodies with costumes, props, and scenic elements. And most importantly, these popular sources provided Hoffman's sculpture with the grounds for their realism. For as I argue in the book, the realism of the races of mankind was a highly mediated form of representation, 
presenting racial types that were known in advance to the viewers, a repertoire of images or sets of representations that they had already had available to them from other sources. And this residue of previous representations granted Hoffman's Races of Mankind sculptures its presumption of the real. Relying on insights from the rich scholarship on race and American legal history, I also contextualize the races of mankind within everyday American views using several landmark law, laws and court cases in the 1920s and 30s, which established race in American civic life along more pronounced color lines, which also marked a dramatic shift away from scientific and anthropological authority on race to side with so-called common sense notions of race. For example, the 1922 Supreme Court ruling against the naturalization of Japanese American Takao Zawa outright dismissed the anthropologist's expert opinions about racial designation and did so on the basis of common sense reasoning on race, which dictated that, quote, whether we consider the Japanese as of the Mongolian race or the Malay race, they are not included in what are commonly understood as white persons, end quote. Thus, the Japanese, who had previously been exempted from the Chinese Exclusion Acts of the 1880s and whose racial status in the United States was indeterminate for many decades, found themselves in one fell swoop lumped into the common sense racial category of the yellow race. Common sense racialism also comes into play through the voices of many regular Americans who came to visit the races of mankind and wrote to Hoffman with their reflections and responses. These visitors' comments provide glimpses into how everyday Americans in the 1930s viewed the sculptures and their efficacy at representing race, testing the claims of both the artist and anthropologist. In one instance, an individual wrote to Hoffman about this group called the Unity of Mankind, which presents figures of a white man, a black man, and a yellow man standing with their backs against a thick column capped by a giant globe. Placed in the center octagonal room that connected the two long axial galleries of the Hall of the Races of Mankind, this statuary group was, according to the museum's guidebook on the hall, not intended to represent any known races or racial types, but meant to symbolize the unity of mankind, man as a well-defined uniform species. Having multiple sides with figures that faced in different directions, the unity group acted as a visual hub for the adjoining galleries and a conceptual synthesis of the exhibit's racial typology, a symbol that would bind up all the divergent strands of race embodied in the motley array of the races of mankind sculptures into these three elemental groups. There is, of course, no such thing as a yellow race or a black race or a white race, as Bertolt Laufer, one of the museum's anthropologists, reminded readers of the guidebook. Quote, in speaking of white, yellow, black, and red men, we follow merely a popular terminology and take surface impressions for granted. While as a matter of fact, the color variability of the complexion in individuals is almost infinite, and no one is either strictly white or yellow or black or red. End quote. And yet, a correspondent wrote to Hoffman relaying this pointed question about the unity group. Quote, Mr. Thompson asked me to ask you if the reason the yellow man is the same height as the rest is because the same height was needed for the support of the globe in the central group. This height has been questioned a number of times. End quote. Mr. Thompson and the others who posed the same question before him seem to have used a common sense understanding of the yellow race that presumed this race was shorter than others, thereby obliging them to question why this figure should be represented the same height as the other figures. If viewers had been willing to accept the symbolic grounds of the sculpture's representation, then as a symbol, the yellow man could conceivably be any height so long as it fulfilled an iconographic or allegorical function. But common sense refused to admit the great heterogeneity of people subsumed under the category of the yellow race, just as it presumed the homogeneity of the white and black races. 
although proposed as a, as a symbolic representation of race, the unity of mankind groups served to reinforce some of the most deeply entrenched notions of common sense racial epistemology providing condensed visualizations of the immutable and essential differences between black, white, and yellow. Finally, in the conclusion, I extend my analysis of racial common sense in a discussion of the popular reception of the sculptures in the present day context. In January 2016, 37 of the Races of Mankind sculptures were put back on display in the Field Museum in a special exhibit entitled, Looking at Ourselves, Rethinking the Sculptures of Malvina Hoffman. I spent several days in the exhibit gallery interviewing museum visitors to gauge how they responded to the sculptures, what kinds of racial templates or scripts they used to make sense of Hoffman's work. I was surprised to discover that the visitors who see the races of mankind in this new ex exhibition mobilize many of the same interpretive strategies evident in the responses of viewers to the sculptures in the 1930s. Today's visitors, like their predecessors at the Field Museum, seem to take for granted the racial realism of the sculptures. As one man noted, quote, but one saw pictures of all that in National Geographic for decades. It was common knowledge end quote, suggesting that Hoffman had drawn upon this common fund of representations. But even after acknowledging how tropic and mediated the races of mankind are, he added, it was very honest, that was honest. This visitor's comment suggested that far from challenging the realism of the races of mankind, the sculpture's visual complements in other media served to reinforce their honesty and only by conforming to established forms of representation could the sculptures seem less contrived. The conversations I had with people in the field in 2016 make a strong case against the look how far we've come progress narratives of American race, demonstrating that Americans in the 1930s were not relative to the current moment, naive or unsophisticated in their understanding of art and race, but that instead, the popular reception of the races of mankind is symptomatic of enduring problems in the ways in which we imagine arts mediation of the world and human diversity. Now here's the part where I address what my book does not do. Because I wanted to emphasize how Hoffman was embedded within systems and structures of race and to sidestep the personalizing focus of racial discourse, I avoided the terms racism or racist in the book in favor of racialism and racialist. And one of the reviewers of the book called me out on this, questioning why I had selected the softer seeming terms instead of being more forthright in my language. At the time of writing this book, this decision made sense to me because I was concerned about two things. One, that by calling Hoffman or anyone else's position in the book racist, I might be singling out these individuals and thereby letting the system off the hook. And two, that I might be reinforcing the narratives of racial progress in which people in the past, including artists, could be racist or espouse racist ideas from which we today are so far removed. But now, I'm not so sure we have to run from terms like racism and racist and even white supremacist anymore. Last year, further back for some people, has introduced a series of intense and important conversations around terminology and the language we use to talk about race. I've highlighted a couple of them here and the publications that have helped shape these debates for me. The conversations are still happening, of course, and there's no definitive position within academia or public discourse on any of these terms, except the rhetoric of non-racism, which I hope we've seen the last of. But the one certainty I've gleaned from these conversations is that when addressing race, what had previously been taken for granted, the genteel discourse we use to avoid making ourselves or others uncomfortable, are no longer adequate to do the job. And if I had to do it over again, I would attempt to use language that more rigorously and trenchantly dealt with the critical stakes of race. Another thing I wish I could do over in my book is how I dealt with blackness and anti-black racism. 
in the 300 pages of my book, A Study on Race in 1930s America, no less. I failed to provide a thorough analysis of the representation of Blackness and the discourse of anti-Blackness, in spite of how fundamental these are to the racial superstructure of American culture. And I've thought a lot about this intellectual and ethical lapse. And so the remainder of my talk is devoted to my reflections on this issue and the speculations about alternative lines of inquiry for my book. There's no representation of Black Americans or any other racialized Americans for that matter in the races of mankind. There are, however, 20 figures representing African subjects and about 18 of these represent sub-Saharan African types that would have been understood in the 1930s as part of the Black race in American popular opinion and Negroid by the period's race science. But these figures exhibit a range of physical features and are not uniform in format or stylistic presentation. Some of the African subjects are represented as exotic and grotesque, like the Ubangi woman in the upper right, with liptus, a form of bodily modification that recommended the model for exhibition as part of Barnum and Bailey's sideshow. Yet other African subjects, like Daboa, the Sarah dancing girl on the lower right, conforms to the long, lean proportions of an American flapper, posed in a relaxed contrapasta with one arm hanging elegantly in the air. The different African figures show that Hoffman's aesthetic vision was not based on a uniform standard of beauty to which all races were pegged into a hierarchical scale. In any given racial category, such Africans, such as Africans, she found certain bodies beautiful and other bodies malformed or unlovely, but equally compelling as subjects of her art. The shifting variable assessment of her racialized subjects placed Hoffman's aesthetic sensibilities in harmony with common sense ideas about race and beauty. Like the artist, racial common sense did not assign all members of a race to a single uniform category of beauty or ugliness. If Hoffman could see the slender nubile grace of Daboa, then everyday people could also recognize the lissom sexuality of Josephine Baker. Even in the 1930s, a period of rampant anti-Black racism and stereotypes, common sense racial aesthetics was flexible and capacious enough to contain evaluations of Black bodies as beautiful and erotic, and Hoffman's ability to adjust her aesthetic strategy, strategies for each of her racial subjects, variably representing their physical virtues and shortcomings, would have made common sense to her lay audience. But a discussion that focuses on the kinds of representation, good or bad, of Blackness only recapitulates the politics of representation that scholars within art history, especially the history of African American art, have criticized as leading to a dead end aesthetic strategy of replacing derogatory images with positive ones, as Lee Rayford has recently argued. And I agree. So what I would like to do instead is to change my book's discussion of how Blacks or Africans in this case are represented to how they are positioned within the visual and representational system of American race. This part is still speculative and in progress, but I'm supported by the reading I've been doing in the study of relational race formation, especially in history and sociology. Scholars like Kelly Little Hernandez, Natalia Molina, Daniel Martinez Hosang, and Raymond Gutierrez have proposed that instead of looking at race and its social construction in terms of the histories of specific racialized groups in isolation from other groups, that we need to study the interaction between groups and the common logic that underpins the forms of inclusion and dispossession they face. Importantly, they make the case that races are not independent already formed groups, but emerge out of the different historical, social, and political relations they have to one another, as well as their relationship to whiteness, and that indeed races are the effect of these relations. A relational race framework compels us to see the formation of blackness as not just one of the many other racial categories created in the US, but one which serves a key function in establishing the racial hierarchy. Thus, as scholar Kelly Little Hernandez has argued in her work on the history of incarceration in California, we cannot understand anti-brownness 
without also unraveling anti-Blackness. One place within the book that seems to lend itself to relational race analysis and the central position of Blacks within American race relations is my discussion in the final chapter of the Blackfoot Indian sculpture and its model. This full-length sculpture was one of the first ones Hoffman completed for the Races of Mankind Commission. And the model for the body, but not its head, was a well-known Indian performer named Sylvester Long. One, uh, in 1928, Long published a popular autobiography, Long Lance, which went through two printings in its first year and was translated into German and Dutch, in addition to having a separate British edition. The following year, he designed a rubber-soled rubber running shoe, the Chief Long Lance Shoe, for the B.F. Goodrich Company, which published How to Talk Indian Sign Language, a 34-page booklet as promotional material for the shoe. The book list is generously illustrated with photographs of Long in a loincloth and feathered headband, the very same costume worn by the figure in Hoffman's Blackfoot Indian, and demonstrating sign, language, sign gestures, just as the figure in the Blackfoot Indian is doing. Long was also the star of a 1930 film, The Silent Enemy, billed as a hybrid documentary feature film that told the story of Chief Chatoga and a struggling band of Ojibwe Indians. Though the film's characters and storyline were fictional, the film's producers stressed the authenticity of the all Indian cast and their actions on screen. Long's prominence in the film meant that the burden of authenticity weighed heavy on his shoulders. According to the film's promotional copy, quote, Chief Longlance is an ideal picture Indian because he is a full-blooded one, chief of his own tribe in these modern times, end quote. Despite his celebrity status, Hoffman never mentioned Long's contribution to her Blackfoot Indian, either in the many published interviews she gave about the races of mankind or in her copious correspondence with the Field Museum. There is a brief mention of Long in her 1965 autobiography, decades after the races of mankind was in the limelight, and a short note on one of the letters from Long among her papers. A possible explanation for Long's, for Hoffman's circumspection about Long comes from several, several of his biographers who claimed that Long was actually a black man passing as a Native American. Born in 1890 in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Long's racial designation and that of his family fluctuated over the course of their lifetimes, as well as across generations. In 1900, Long and his family were listed as black in the US Census. And then in 1920, they were mulatto, but in 1930, they were listed as Negro. His father, Joseph Sylvester Long, was the mixed race son of a slave woman and a white farmer. And his mother's parents, Reuben Lindsay and Adeline Carson, claimed to belong to a group in North Carolina called Croatans, today the Lumbee peoples. The Croatan Lumbees are a hybridized group formed out of the admixture of Native Americans indigenous to the Carolinas with Blacks and white European settlers, many of whom were simply identified as free people of color for most of the 19th century. It was only after the Civil War in the post-Reconstruction racial violence and white supremacy that erupted in the South that Croatan Lumbees petitioned North Carolina for recognition as Indians. But standing in the way of the Croatan Lumbee's transformation from colored to Indian was the combined effect of the one drop rule and the rule of hypo descent, increasingly setting the terms of race in the United States. As I discuss in the book, the one drop rule dictates that individuals within, with any amount, even one drop of black ancestry are designated as black. And in the United States, this rule goes hand in hand with the rule of hypo descent, which establishes that mixed race individuals are assigned the race of the subordinate group. Croatan Lumbees attempted to accommodate the imposition of the hypo descent and one drop rules by purging formally secure members whose physical appearance, social relations, or reputation hinted at blackness. 
It is possible then under these conditions that Long's family, once identified as members of the group consolidated after the Civil War under the name Karatin, was ostracized thereafter because of past or existing intermarriage with Blacks. Thus, it would not be accurate to characterize Long as a racial imposter or someone trying to pass as Indian. Instead, we might more productively think about Long in terms of the different but interconnected ways Blacks and Indians negotiated the American racial order. At the turn of the century, Indians too were being subjected to the racial logic of blood quantum for the first time in their histories required by federal and state governments to justify their communities and members by translating kinship and family histories into units of Indian blood. And because the construction of blackness made any Negro or colored ancestry, no matter how much Indian heritage, grounds for permanent absorption into blackness, the Kuratan Lumbees constructed their Indianness in opposition to blackness. A relational framework helps us see that the racial construction of Long, both his own and that of others, imposed on him and his family, did not rely on static notions of either Indian or Black, but emerged from the dynamic and mutually constitutive interactions between these terms in the Jim Crow, in the Jim Crow South. In conclusion, I want to acknowledge that the kind of work I'm proposing, this relational analysis of race that keeps blackness within the frame as a central point of reference is not going to be easy in art history. The artwork and artworks and archival materials that we normally rely upon may not be the places or the objects where we find resources to talk about the visualization of relational race formation in black Americans. And so, as Natalia Molina urges historians, we art historians may have to begin looking elsewhere for our historical material and also posing new kinds of questions to our material. Once again, I am deeply honored by this award and believe that recognition like this reminds us as scholars how valuable our work is and how necessary our critical voices are to make sense of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. I especially appreciate your demonstration of the relational framework, which I think will be very important for the field going further. We have a question from Grace Yasumura. Uh, hi, Linda, congratulations and thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, I was so struck by your discussion in your second chapter of the way Hoffman um, has employed modernist uh, display techniques to create these really deeply aestheticized and highly mediated encounters of her work at the Field Museum. And I wondered if you might discuss um, the ways that art museums in particular should help viewers encounter the sculptures she created for the Races of Mankind series now. Um, and you know, how can art museums disrupt, I think, the beauty and realism that is assumed and read into these works, um, given the impossibility of entangling uh, the works from the racism embedded in their origins, what might be some different uh, strategies for their display? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Grace. Um, that's a great question. Um, so I think, um, you know, the Field Museum did a marvelous job of uh, gathering up a lot of archival and contextual material, which they mostly embedded into digital displays. So there are these um, little like tablet kind of things up on um, uh, stanchions and people can kind of scroll through the sculpture. They can click on uh, an image of a sculpture and then kind of navigate multiple different pathways where they see uh, its relationship to other representation sometimes, you know, again, like with some of the stuff that I did showed like uh, popular culture images of the times and some of the source uh, photographs that she used or made. Um, and um, so 
One of the things that I worried about as I watched uh, individuals in the galleries at the Looking at Ourselves show was that um, a lot of people didn't spend a lot of time <laughs> going through the digital display. So I wonder if there's a more active way that that same material could be presented. And I would definitely sort of urge museums, particularly you know, in the case of the a natural history museum like the field, uh, but also, you know, art museums to um, disrupt this idea that the um, art object has to be presented in this kind of uh, sanitized, you know, the white cube display. And, um, and it's okay if it's, you know, it's make the display messy, right? <laughs> cluttered, you know, like the very things that you're not supposed to do. I, I wonder um, if, you know, that you know, if we could try something else, right, and and pose, um, you know, I don't know, large kind of uh, photographic murals behind the works. Um, you know, one of the things I, I say, uh, I discuss in the conclusion has to do with the text that the identify, it, it, it's just, um, so in the installation of the races of mankind today, they, they're these very small little um, text identifying uh, the subjects. Um, and the subjects are identified today by geographic designations um, that are used by um, geographers and anthropologists today and scientists. Um, but I wondered, uh, you know, I, it, one of the, the sculptures is identified then as the woman from Sudan or the Sudan woman. But I point out that, in fact, actually the term Sudan is incredibly um, sort of, you know, ambiguous, right? It was ambiguous, um, you know, in the 1930s um, and partly, you know, let's recognize Sudan just became two countries, right? I mean, this like kind of geographic sort of fixity is not, uh, is not something that secures any kind of meaning for, um, uh, for viewers throughout time. And so the Sudan, uh, instead of putting Sudan, I wondered what if they put like a bunch of different kinds of geographic labels around the objects to uh, the sculptures to uh, recognize that, you know, the models or the subjects of the sculptures were actually, uh, you know, refugees, uh, imperial subjects, uh, people who were displaced and stateless in some cases, right? Um, uh, people who uh, actually, you know, sort of had two different national sort of affiliations. Um, so yeah, so that, I mean, that, that kind of display, you know, I, I, you know, I don't work in museums, so I don't know actually what the actual physical uh, thing would look like. But, you know, I, I, I just pose that as like one other way that we might, um, display the works. Thank you. I think we have a question from Karen Lemmy. Hi, Karen. Hi, what a wonderful talk. I feel like I need to read the book all over again with new eyes. Thank you, Linda. Um, I. I'm struck because it's so interesting how the Field Museum chose to reinstall the collection after having it off view for quite some years. And it's really telling to see how the public responses of the work uh, today so closely echo those of the 1930s, at least across some, some members of the public. But uh, what comes to mind is how other natural history and science museums, including the Smithsonian's natural history, Museum um, have recently installed bronze figures in uh, various halls of human evolution, for example. And so I wondered if you had thoughts um, how this is sort of taking, taking shape. Um, why is there such an insistence on bodying forth the human body? And if you had further thoughts too on bronze, um, that it seems a very deliberate choice of, of bronze, especially in the 21st century. Yeah, um, I think sculpture has um, the virtue of being three-dimensional and, uh, and has volume like bodies do. <laughs> um, it's a good gauge for the way, uh, for visitors uh, to gauge the kinds of propositions about, you know, scale and, and physical features and the sizes of noses <laughs> and the shape uh, uh, against, uh, and to verify these kinds of um, claims against sculpture, you know, when they walk into museums, particularly um, museums that are about physical 
uh, the sort of physical anthropology or paleobiography of hu humanity. Um, so I there and there's a sort of long-standing history about like using um, primarily bronze sculpture. There's you know there's been a lot of these sort of installations around like um, early, early hominid. Uh, evolutionary halls that use bronze sculpture. Uh, but there's also mannequins, right, which is another um, uh, technology or display form that museums had relied upon uh, for, you know, decades by the time Hoffman enters in. Um, you know, in the 1920s and 30s, what you see natural history museums doing is, you know, making, and, you know, this is not an argument that I came up with, but, you know, Alex Conklin in her great book, uh, The Museum of Man, that's about um, the uh, Trocadero slash Musée de l'Homme, actually argues that the, the natural history museums began to uh, try to integrate um, art into their exhibitions in order to appeal to um, a broader audience, perhaps, you know, also, um, a, an older, more sophisticated audience, right? Because um, there was a way in which natural history museums can be associated, not just with stuffy, stuffy people in lab coats, but also with like children's and school groups. And so uh, to bring in, uh, you know, people um, uh, who are interested in art and culture, uh, a, a lot of uh, museums then turn to art and this idea of kind of uh, aesthetics as a uh, kind of remedy to, also, you know, exhibits that they were incredibly concerned uh, had a kind of ghastly quality about it because that, you know, there were um, objects that seemed, uh, you know, to just be fragments and ruins of, you know, uh, you know, what was presumably a sort of dead or dying culture. And so art then comes in to act as a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a compliment or a consolation, I should say, a consolation to what the museum's collections. Thank you both. Okay, we have another question from Janine DeFeo. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this fabulous and really intellectually generous talk. Um, I was so struck by uh, the way you used interviewing as a way to think about common sense racial racial ideology, even though you're talking about an object from the 1930s. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about your experience interviewing contemporary audiences. Like, is this a common methodology in your research? At what stage in the research did you conduct these interviews and how did they feed back into your argumentation? Thanks. Um, that was uh, that was not a common uh, methodology. <laughs> that was a very brand new one, and I was really kind of flying uh, by the seat of my pants on that one. Um, but having read and being friends with a lot of sociologists, um, I had some sense of. Um, I mean, I, th I think one of the things that uh, my sociologist friends have taught me is to demystify, you know, this idea that you know you go in with like um, you know this question. I mean, I, they have to go through human subject reviews and all things, and, and that I did not do, but um, that there is this like clear sort of research agenda, and you know exactly the kind of answers you're trying to get, right? So I went in there with some kind of script uh, in loosely in my head, but um, mostly just, you know, I was open to just hearing what people had to say. So I, I would approach people and, and you know, and I, I was trying to sort of figure out which were the people who had been in the gallery for a while and, and weren't just like kind of like running through it really quick. Um, and so after I could tell if they had read at least one or two of the museum sort of text, wall text, and, and actually maybe even watch the video, there's a short, um, I think it's only like a 10, five minute video that's on a loop in the gallery. I would approach them and I would ask them, what do you think, you know, like a very, open-ended question like what do you think about um uh these uh, this exhibition and then many of them would actually not volunteer race as any like nowhere would they talk about race and so I sometimes I would then have to step in and say oh but what you know what do you think about these sculptures as uh in terms of race or how they present race and 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 then you know I I would get these sometimes you know very sort of um 
it, it, it was really just a, a kind of grab bag of, you know, of confusing and confuse themselves kind of responses. And I, I recognize what the awkwardness of that situation is, right? You know, like no one wants to walk into a museum and be approached by a stranger and asked to talk about race. I mean, because it's, it is such a freighted um, conversation. Um, and so uh, sometimes, you know, uh, people would say, oh, well, I wasn't thinking about race, you know, which was that, that alone is that's like a gold mine right there to say you weren't thinking about race inside that, uh, that gallery. But um, so I was really, um, I myself was very humbled by that experience because I realized how hard it is for um, sociology, people who use this kind of methodology of like, um, you know, talking to people who are not, you know, other academics who um, you can't make assumptions that, you know, there's this kind of common language or set of texts. Um, and then also museum professionals themselves, right, who are, they're always thinking about these people. They're always interacting with these people in the galleries. And that I, I was like, wow, <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, I, I don't know if I'll be doing that again, let's say. That's, <laughs> but I learned a great deal from it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. This is the last call for questions. I think we're going to wrap it up unless anybody suddenly pops up. I'd like to really thank all of the participants who are here with us today, who have come to join us for the live taping, which is always so enjoyable. And thank you, Linda. I really appreciate your self-reflection in doing this and the self-criticality and very excited to see what you do next. Congratulations to you. Imagine all of us <laughs> clapping and going into the lobby and toasting you with champagne. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for joining today. <laughs>